All right, microbes and human disease. We're gonna go through diseases by different systems of the body. So we're gonna start with the skin and eyes. Now we already know that intact skin is pretty much impenetrable to most microbes. It also has some other features that make it suboptimal for uh, bacteria. So it has a little moisture present, except in the areas of the skin folds. Sweat itself is salty and contains lysozyme, a naturally antimicrobial compound. The sebum that our skin makes inhibits some microbes, but on the other hand, it's food for others. Our mucous membranes have acidic secretions, which we know that bacteria don't like pHs that are very low. And our eyes are being continually washed by tears, which also have lysozyme in them. Our skin does though have normal microbiota, typically aerobic bacteria. Uh, some of them will produce fatty acids from the sebum. So they feed on the sebum and make fatty acids. Those fatty acids can actually inhibit the growth of other microbes. Um, our skin is also colonized by bacteria that are resistant to conditions on the skin. So they're resistant to drying out, they're resistant to salty um, conditions. Gram-positive cosi like staphylococcus and micrococcus are probably the biggest part of our skin microbiota um, and they're very well adapted for life there. When we wash our skin, we're not completely eliminating the microbiome on our skin. Microbes can remain in the hair follicles and the sweat glands and although you're washing um, cells off from the surface, they can come out of the hair follicles and sweat glands and reestablish populations on the skin very soon after washing. So they don't really ever go away. Uh, and, and as you would expect, there are higher populations of microbes in moist areas. Okay, some of them can metabolize secretions from sweat glands. That's what causes body odor. Um, they like to live in those warm, moist areas. A couple of other normal skin microbiota, which can cause problems. Um, the diphtheroids, which are gram-positive rods, they are things like Propineobacterium acnes, which is one of the many bacteria implicated in acne. Uh, <clears throat> it lives in hair follicles, it grows on sebum, it can produce um, propinic acid, which also can help lower the pH of the skin, so that will inhibit other microbes, um, but it doesn't hurt the Propineobacterium acnes. A yeast that grows on our skin, um, M. furfur, is capable of growing on sebum and is thought to be responsible for dandruff. So a lot of the zinc pyrithicone or selenium sulfide or other things in anti-dandruff shampoos are um, active against M. furfur. Now skin lesions can arise uh, typically from infection, but also from systemic diseases. Um, there's different kinds of skin lesions. I've put diagrams of them here for you. And then we have our skin diseases. So our Staphylococcus bacteria, um, when skin is intact, is not normal microbiota on the surface of the skin, right? But when skin is broken, Staphylococcus can get through the skin into the body and cause infections. Staphylococcus likes to make biofilms on things like IV catheters. It also is what has given us MRSA, right? Most Staphylococcus aureus strains, which is the species that gives rise to MRSA, um, live in the nasal passages. They produce yellow pigment, which helps protect them from UV damage, so they can be on the surface of the skin without being damaged. They can produce toxins that can damage tissue or kill host defense. They can cause a very vigorous inflammatory response and can cause sepsis. So you can get infections um, of the skin and, and the cutaneous infections of Staph aureus that can really get very bad very quickly. The cell walls of Staph aureus bacteria are also lysozyme resistant. 
um, which is a feature that they've adapted by living on the skin where lysozyme is present. So lots of bad things can happen when Staph aureus gets into the body. And that's even before we talk about the antibiotic resistant strains that have come up. <clears throat> Other things Staph aureus can do, um, they can cause impetigo, which is a contagious skin infection, which causes what's called scalded skin syndrome. It actually looks like the skin has been burnt. Um, it's a problem in some young children, although I've never encountered a knock on wood, and I don't know how prevalent it is nowadays. Streptococcus. So we've got Staphylococcus, now we're talking about Streptococcus. Streptococcus is a group of bacteria that are major human pathogens and the infections they cause depend on where in the body they are. So they can infect the skin, they can secrete toxins and enzymes, including things like hemolysin, which can lyse red blood cells. Um, depending on the type of, that of streptococcus you have, they're either categorized as alpha hemolytic, beta hemolytic, or gamma hemolytic. Gamma is non-hemolytic. Um, the beta hemolytic strep are the most associated with human disease. That group has been broken down further into types A through T. So there's like beta, hemolytic, streptococcus, type A or whatever. Um, type A are kind of the most common human pathogens like streptococcus pyrogenes. They produce these chemicals called streptolysins that can lyse red blood cells. They're toxic, toxic to neutrophils. Um, they have M protein on their surface, which helps evade phagocytosis and it helps them adhere to mucous membranes. So this guy is a bad guy. Um, it also has capsule around it, which we remember can shelter it from the immune system by covering up some antigens, making it harder to phagocytose. On the capsule, it has hyaluronic acid, which is something that our connective tissue has, so it resembles human connective tissue, and that further helps it evade the host's defense. So there are lots of different skin diseases that streptococcus bacteria can cause. Strep pyrogenes can cause erysipelas, which is a, an infection of the dermal layer of the skin. It can appear on the face, usually following um, strep throat infection. It can progress to local tissue destruction. It can even enter the bloodstream and cause sepsis, but it is treatable with antibiotics. If you guys have heard of necrotizing fasciitis, um, I know some of my students who work in medicine have actually seen it on patients. Um, it is a streptococcus infection. It's essentially like a flesh eating infection. Skin just dies um, and, and necrodes and it's very bad. Um, and surgeons can go in and remove the necroded tissue, but it spreads very rapidly. It has a high rate of systemic toxicity and death. Other skin diseases, acne. We, a lot of us encounter acne in different parts of our lives. <clears throat> um, acne happens when skin cells are shed in higher than normal amounts. Combine that with sebum and you get clogged follicles, right? Those clogged follicles can get infected. Um, depending on the degree of the acne, it can be treated with different things. Um, they make some really great drugs now that um, can treat acne, uh, <clears throat> including Accutane, which actually is for the most severe acne, which um, was thought to be discontinued in the US, but it's actually not discontinued. It's just prescribed very, very carefully now because of the high risk of side effects, including birth defects. Um, but it is still available for very severe cases. All right, viral skin diseases, warts. Warts are caused by papillomaviruses. There's lots of different papillomaviruses. Um, <clears throat> when they infect the skin, they can cause warts. They're usually treated with cryotherapy or um, electrodesiccation or with acid, right? We know papillomaviruses when we think of cervical cancer, right? They're associated, there are a few very oncogenic strains a papillomavirus that have been known to cause cervical cancer. Smallpox is a viral disease of the skin. 
it is transmitted by the respiratory route and it affects the internal organs and then the bloodstream and then the skin. Chickenpox and shingles are the same virus, right? Herpes virus, varicella zoster. It enters the respiratory system. The infection will then localize to the skin cells after a couple of weeks. You get these lesions filled with pus and they rupture and form a scab. Um, after that heals, the virus then moves into the nerves, the dorsal root ganglions, and it remains latent indefinitely, which is why you can have chicken pox early in life and shingles later in life. Shingles is a reactivation of the virus that causes chicken pox because it, it lays dormant in your nerve cells um, for decades even sometimes. Other viral skin diseases, the herpes simplex diseases, there are two types, one and two. Um, one is the oral and respiratory route infection usually occurs early in life and most people have HSV-1. Um, whether they get cold sores or not depends on the person and their stress level and things like that. Some people get them and some people don't. Um, but just like chicken pox is a herpes virus and it goes latent into the nerve cells, um, herpes simplex viruses one and two can also go latent into the nerve cells as well and then become reactivated. We know HSV2 has the STD. It actually lays latent in the sacral nerve ganglia near the base of the spine. Um, and either HSV, and this is interesting, either type could spread to the brain and cause encephalitis. Here's another interesting one, um, especially as it's being more prevalent now um, because of the failure to vaccinate is measles. Measles is um, also called rubiola. It is extremely, extremely contagious, which is why the vaccination is so important. It's even extremely contagious before the symptoms appear, right? So you're most likely to spread something when you have acquired an infection, you don't really feel sick yet, you're going about your normal activities like nothing's wrong, but unbeknownst to you, you're already producing huge amounts of viral particles and you just don't always have symptoms yet. They're on the way, right? And that's a lot of the time when virus, viruses are spread. Measles is spread by the respiratory route. It starts with similar symptoms similar to a cold, but then it spreads to a rash on the face and then the trunk and the extremities. It causes these small red lesions with these blue-white specks on top called coplic spots. Um, there's a picture of it up in the top corner of this slide. It's one of the hallmark features of measles. Uh, measles itself can cause frequent and dangerous complications like middle ear infections, pneumonia, or secondary bacterial infections, encephalitis. Uh, <clears throat> in survivors of encephalitis, they're often left with brain damage. Vaccination had eliminated most of the measles in the U.S. We didn't really see it before, um, like 10 years ago, probably even more recent than that. But we're seeing it more now because of the failure to vaccinate. Measles is especially hazardous to infants because they're too young to be protected by the vaccine. Um, maternal antibodies protect babies from most things, but they're not very effective at protecting against measles, unfortunately. Other things, uh, rubella or German measles. It's a milder form of measles, uh, but it can cause birth defects if a pregnant woman is infected. Fitz disease is caused by a parvovirus. It's called parvovirus B19. It gives you mild flu-like symptoms with a facial rash. Roseola is caused by a couple of different strains of herpes virus. There's lots of different strains of herpes viruses. It <clears throat> can cause a Kind of mild disease followed by high fever and then a rash. And recovery usually will lead to immunity of roseola. <clears throat> Hand, foot, and mouth disease is caused by um, enteroviruses. There are many different enteroviruses as well spread through contact with mucus or saliva from infected people and causes fever, sore throat, and a rash on um, the hands, on the feet, and in the mouth. Fungi can cause skin diseases as well, right? Um, 
on the cutaneous layer of the skin, you have the dermatophytes. They grow on the keratin in the hair. They grow on nails. They grow on the outer layer of the epidermis, which is called the stratum corneum. The trichophyton microsporum or ophidiomorphin. Okay. Um, a lot of them are referred to as tinea, tinea capitis, tinea curis, tinea pedis, um, tinea ungum. So these are things like um, scalp infections of fungi, which can lead to things like dandruff, um, jock itch, athlete's foot, ringworm, <clears throat> um, fungal nail infections, right? They're usually treated very easily with topical over-the-counter drugs. Subcutaneous fungal diseases are more serious, but they're more rare. They typically enter through wounds. It's usually um, fungi found commonly in the environment in soil that can cause these infections. Um, it can even cause ulcers and it can enter the lymphatic system um, and infect the body systemically. Then we have candidiasis, right? Candida albicans is the cause of agent for what we think of when we think of yeast infections. It infects the mucous membranes, or it can also cause thrush if it infects the mouth. Our eyes can also be infected. There are lots of different microbes that can, can infect the mucous membrane that lines the eyelids and covers the outer white surface of the eyeball, that's the conjunctiva. <clears throat> For bacteria, we've got things like hemophilus influenza, it doesn't just cause the flu. Um, it can cause eye infections. Neisseria gonorrhea can cause very serious eye infections, and chlamydia can as well. Uh, for viruses, adenovirus infections are the most common. A lot of adenoviruses can also cause um, things like the common cold. Um, HSV-1 can cause infectious blindness, so that's bad, um, because it causes deep cornea ulcers. Um, if you are wearing contacts, you are at increased risk for infection, um, especially by the Pseudomonas bacteria, which can cause serious eye damage. So it's really important to keep your contacts clean, right? <clears throat> you can also get fungal infections of the eye. Fungal keratitis causes inflammation in the cornea itself. It can lead to blindness, usually only after eye trauma, but it can be related to contaminated contact solution. So again, um, <clears throat> keep your contacts clean. And then there's an amoeba that can cause eye infections as well. All right, the nervous system. So the nervous system is composed of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. You guys probably already know that, right? The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. It's covered by the meninges. And then there's cerebral spinal fluid between the innermost and middle areas. Cerebral spinal fluid does not have the same immune cells and complexes as the rest of the blood, which makes it very vulnerable to infection. The good news is that it's very segregated from the rest of the body and doesn't get infected easily. But if something does get in, then infection can spread very quickly. The peripheral nervous system are nerves that come off from the brain and spinal cord and go through the body. The good news is that most pathogens can't cross the blood-brain barrier, right? Um, but some pathogens can start replicating in a peripheral nerve and then migrate up that nerve to the brain and the spinal cord. The type of infection you get depends on the location and not the specific bug causing it. If you have meningitis, you have inflammation of the meninges that can cause, be caused by lots of different um, bacteria and viruses. Same thing with encephalitis. If you have inflammation of the meninges and the brain, you have what's called meningoencephalitis. When you have inflammation, it weakens the blood-brain barrier, and then it increases the ability of the central nervous system to be infected by pathogens that are in the blood and the lymph. So viral meningitis are, is the most common, but it's more mild. It's usually caused by different kinds of enteroviruses. Uh, bacterial meningitis are caused by things like hemophilia influenza type B, Neisseria meningitides, streptococcus pneumonia. All three of these guys have capsules that help them evade the immune system. 
right? Death from meningitis is usually due to shock and inflammation of the brain um, caused by the release of endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria when they die, or caused by um, toxins released from gram-positive bacteria and the immune response to both of those. Other opportunistic bacteria can also cause meningitis, okay? And we are seeing, and we are seeing the emergence of antibiotic resistant strains of meningitis. Other nervous system diseases, listeria monocytogenes, um, can cause different infections, but it can cause meningitis. It's a gram-positive rod. It's common in soil and water. Um, occasionally, we get food that's contaminated with listeria. It can cross the placenta into the fetus and cause abortion and stillbirth. Um, and it's, like I said, usually foodborne, which is one of the reasons they tell pregnant women to avoid um, deli meat that hasn't been cooked or certain um, fruits and vegetables. So they can be contaminated with listeria. Tetanus is a soil dwelling bacteria cluster named tetani. It is an endospore former. It's a gram positive rod and obligate anaerobe. It produces neurotoxins, right? When you think of tetanus disease, you think of uh, muscles kind of seizing up and being contracted, right? That happens because of neurotoxins that cluster named tetani make that enter the central nervous system via peripheral nerves or by blood and it blocks the relaxation pathway of muscles, specifically in the jaw, so that those muscles are constantly contracted. And it usually starts in the jaw and then it spreads throughout the body and, cause, and can cause death. The vaccine for tetanus focuses on neutralizing the toxin. Um, the tetanus vaccines like the DTaP are very widely available, but even in, in the United States, over half of the adults in the United States do not have adequate protection against tetanus because they don't get their tetanus booster shots every 10 years like they should. Other nervous system diseases that are important, botulism caused by Clostridium botulinum. It's an anaerobic endospore forming gram positive rod like every other Clostridium. Uh, this one is very big in food poisoning, but it also makes botulism toxin or Botox. Um, which is a neurotoxin, right? In anaerobic environments, like a sealed can of food, it produces large amounts of that neurotoxin and it can cause food poisoning. Or it can cause progressive flaccid paralysis, which can cause death from respiratory and cardiac failure. Good news is the toxin is destroyed by normal cooking that reaches boiling temperatures. It can also be destroyed by nitrites, which is why nitrites are often used to preserve food, um, or a pH below 4.7. Polio is a viral nervous system disease. Polio causes progressive paralysis. Rabies is a viral nervous system disease. It causes a fatal encephalitis. It comes from the saliva of an infected animal. It gets deposited into a new host through bite wounds. Um, it is almost always fatal if the um, new host does not get the rabies vaccines right away after it gets bitten um, because the incubation period is long enough to allow for immunity to develop from vaccination before the incubation period ends. So that's why they give rabies vaccines right away if someone gets infected. Um, other viral nervous system diseases, uh, the mosquito-borne encephalitis diseases like West Nile, Triple E, uh, Western equine encephalitis, those are all um, nervous system diseases. There can be fungal infections of the nervous system, specifically by cryptococcus species. Uh, it comes from inhaling dried bird droppings. It spreads through to the central nervous system. It can cause meningitis. Um, these fungi have a very thick capsule, which helps them evade the host defense. All right, cardiovascular and lymphatic systems. So you guys know what those are, the cardiovascular system, the heart, the blood, blood vessels, the lymphatic system, the lymph, the lymph vessels, the nodes, and the lymph organs like the tonsils, the appendix, the spleen, and the thymus. Right, their job is to distribute the contents of the blood of the lymph throughout the body. But that spread throughout the body can also spread pathogens throughout the body if pathogens get into those systems. 
how does the lymph work? This is really interesting. <clears throat> I spent a long time studying the immune system and um, didn't really understand how the lymph itself worked. So plasma from capillaries of blood filters into surrounding tissue. It's called interstitial fluid. This fluid then enters the lymph capillaries, is now called lymph, and it gets channeled to larger lymphatic vessels called lymphatics. Um, and when that fluid goes from the tissue to the vessels, it takes cells and potential pathogens and things like that with it. The lymph then returns to the heart through the lymphatic circulatory system, which channels lymph into a vein. But as it goes into a vein, it passes through a lymph node. And lymph nodes are um, these little tiny organs, if you will, uh, where you have a lot of resident immune cells. So um, macrophages, T cells, B cells, those kind of thing. Um, the lymph shows the pathogens that it picks up in the fluid to the T and B cells in the lymph nodes. And if the T and B cells recognize those pathogens, they can make a response. Lymph nodes themselves can become infected and swollen. Um, lymph nodes also swell up when an immune response is going on because T or B cells, if they're responding to a pathogen, they usually multiply in number a lot very quickly and that causes swelling. All right, bacterial diseases of the cardiovascular lymph systems. So with bacteria, it's all about location, right? And when bacteria gets into the blood, that can cause sepsis and septic, septic shock. So blood contaminated with growing microbes or their toxins is called septicemia. It causes a systemic inflammatory response, right? Because it's in the blood, the blood is going body-wide. So the response will be body-wide as well. Um, it causes, releases uh, mediators of inflammation into the bloodstream, okay? And that causes sepsis. So you get literally inflammation coming into your bloodstream. A lot of times this happens because of gram-positive bacteria and exotoxins. If the body does not quickly control that infection, uh, the results are usually progressive and fatal with septic shock and death. Bacteria can also travel through the blood to different tissues, like tissues of the heart, like the endocardium, and cause things like endocarditis. Endocarditis is uh, inflammation of the heart muscle and the heart valves. So it can be subacute or acute. Subacute develops slowly. Um, usually caused by alpha hemolytic streptococcus bacteria. Remember, streptococcus can infect lots of different things. Generally arises from an infection somewhere else in the body, like the teeth or the tonsils. One of the reasons they tell you that, you know, if you have gingivitis or um, other periodontal diseases, that it could cause um, heart damage and infection in your heart if it's not taken care of. Acute endocarditis is usually caused by Staph aureus. Remember, Staph aureus lives in our skin, right? Um, if it causes an infection in the body, those um, pathogens can then travel to the heart. It causes really rapid destruction of the heart valves and it's fatal within days. Uh, bacteria can also cause pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardium, usually caused by streptococcus bacteria again. Other things, rheumatic fever, tularemia, anthrax. Anthrax not only um, infects the lungs, but it can multiply and kill macrophages in the bloodstream, which then secrete toxins and cause sepsis um, systemically. It's most fatal when it's inhaled because of the increased probability of entering the bloodstream through the lungs. So yes, although it can be thought of as a lung pathogen, it really um, is most deadly when it gets systemic. Then we have gangrene, right, talking about diseases of the blood and lymph, right? When a wound becomes anaerobic because it's lost blood supply, that's called ischemia, it causes tissue death, and then you have an anaerobic wound or anaerobic tissue, and you have anaerobic bacteria like Clostridium that likes to grow in anaerobic places like anaerobic tissue. So clostridium, like clostridium um, perfrigens and other species, 
will actually grow on ice ischemic wounds. They will ferment carbohydrates in the tissue that can produce gas and swelling, and that causes gas gangrene, which is really nasty if you've ever seen it. Um, they, the clostridium, remember clostridium like to produce toxins, right? These toxins will kill cells and make more necrotic tissue, so you get um, necrosis in your tissue that has gangrene. Uh, and eventually those toxins and bacteria can enter the bloodstream. Interestingly, we have some diseases that can spread through the blood that are transmitted by animals, either animal bites or scratches or mosquito vectors. Domestic cats and dogs can carry pasturella, which can cause sepsis or pneumonia, staphylococcus, streptococcus, corneobacterium, those are all really common human pathogens. Those can infect through bite wounds. Uh, Bartonella, cat scratch disease, cat scratch fever, um, can inhabit cat red blood cells, which is carried by about half of the cats in the United States. It can also multiply in the digestive system of the cat flea, interestingly. Uh, rat bite fever caused by a streptococcus or spirillium bacteria. Um, and then plague. Plague causes hemorrhaging. Uh, resulting in dark blue areas of skin. It's usually transmitted or caused by Yersinia pestis, Y pestis, which is transmitted by rat fleas. So the flea jumps on the rat, has a blood meal, gets the Y pestis from the rat, right? And then if that flea jumps on a human, it can transmit that to humans. We have things like relapsing fever from species of Borrelia that don't cause Lyme disease. Borrelia burgdorferi is the causative agent for Lyme disease, but there are other species. Um, but they cause relapsing fevers, rose-colored skin spots, kind of similar to what Lyme disease can do, right? Um, for Lyme disease, though, interestingly enough, the biggest reservoir are field mice transmitted to humans by ticks, we know that, right? But the ticks feed on the mice, they pick up the pathogen and then they feed on the humans. If Lyme disease goes untreated for a very long time, it can affect the heart and it can cause neurological symptoms. The last one I'm gonna mention is typhus caused by Rickettsia prolozeki. It um, is essentially carried by the human body louse causes high and prolonged fever and rash from subcutaneous hemorrhaging and is very deadly if it's left untreated. Diseases of the lymph, lymphoma, mononucleosis, cytomegalovirus infection. Lymphoma is a cancerous tumor um, of the lymph nodes, usually in the jaw, caused by Epstein-Barr virus, which also causes mononucleosis, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, Burkitt's lymphoma is seen a lot in Africa, particularly because malaria can weaken the host defenses against it. Infectious mononucleosis is what you think of when you think of mono, um, also caused from Epstein-Barr virus, fever, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, weakness, fatigue, um, usually caused by a very intense immunological response to the virus. The peak incidence in the United States for mono is 15 to 25 years old. The good news is that it rarely causes death, but it can cause the spleen to swell up a lot. And when a spleen is really swollen, it can be easily ruptured. And there's a four to seven week incubation period for mono. So I got mono when I was a junior, I believe. Yes, a junior in college, right after my junior year started. Um, and I was out for like a month. It was awful, awful, awful. Um, just the fatigue and the swollen lymph nodes. It was, it's absolutely crazy. Um, cytomegalovirus infection. A cytomegalus, cytomegalovirus is in the herpes virus family. It can be transmitted to the fetus um, if the mother is infected during pregnancy. It can cause lots of problems like mental retardation or hearing loss. Um, in immunocompromised patients, it can cause pneumonia and blindness. There are a few other viral hemorrhagic fevers, yellow fever, uh, dengue, and there's lots of new emerging ones as well. Um, these are generally mosquito-borne viruses starting out in tropical areas that are slowly spreading across the world, kind of like West Nile did. 
um, other noteworthy emerging viral hemorrhagic fevers, things like Ebola, loss of fever, Marburg virus, Bolivian hemorrhagic virus, hantavirus. The most noteworthy one here is Ebola, right? We've talked about Ebola before. Okay, diseases of the respiratory system. Just like with other infections in the body, um, diseases of the respiratory system can be caused by many different pathogens, and the disease, them, the, the disease itself is often named for the location and not the causative agent. So the upper respiratory system is a major, 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 major portal of entry for pathogens, right? Nose, pharynx, mouth, all of those associated structures. Every breath you take in contains lots and lots of microbes. Hair in your nose filters out large dust particles, which can have pathogens attached to them. Mucus moistens the inhaled air, traps dust and microbes coming in. The cilia in your nose, in your throat, um, help move particles out for elimination. So there's lots of good defenses we have built in against all of the microbes we're breathing in all of the time. The lower respiratory system, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchial tubes, the alveoli, right, getting into the lungs. There are normal microbiota in the upper respiratory tract that help compete with the bad guys. But the lower respiratory tract is just about sterile because of the ciliary, the ciliary escalators in the bronchial tubes. Okay, so not much can get down in there. So infections of the upper respiratory system, things like pharyngitis, laryngitis, tonsillitis, sinusitis, um, epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is interesting because it prevents ingested material from entering the larynx and uh, infection there can result in rapid death. It's usually caused by hemophilus influenza type B. We've heard hemophilus influenza before talking about human pathogens, right? Streptococcal pharyngitis or strep throat, usually caused by strep pyrogenes, uh, most commonly transmitted by respiratory se secretions, right? We've all dealt with strep throat or had kids or patients or family members deal with strep throat at one point in time. It's really common, right? Scarlet fever, when that strep pyrogenes uh, produces a specific toxin called erythrogenic toxin, <clears throat> because it has that strep pyrogenes has been infected with a bacteriophage, which gives it the ability to transmit that toxin. It causes a red rash, it can cause the tongue to become very enlarged. Sometimes this is associated with strep throat, sometimes not. Diphtheria, diphtheria causes sore throat fever, swelling of the neck. It forms a very tough membrane in the throat that can block air. And in 1935, or until 1935, it was the leading infectious killer of all children in the USA, um, which is why we have a vaccine against it now, and it's not anymore, right? The DTaP vaccine actually vaccinates against the diphtheria toxin itself, which is really what does the most damage. Otis media, ear infections. Uh, ear infections are caused by the formation of pus that builds up and puts pressure on the eardrum. Really frequent in early childhood because that auditory tube is much smaller and easily blocked if you are a small human. Uh, there's lots of different bacteria that can cause Otis media. Um, strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, um, strep pyrogenes, staph aureus, or it can even be viral. Common cold. There are more than 200 different viruses that cause the common cold. A lot of them are rhinoviruses. Some of them are coronaviruses. Um, however, we now know that some coronavirus diseases uh, can be quite severe. Um, and some viruses that cause common cold are completely unknown. We have no idea what they are. Viruses are carried on airborne droplets. We know that, we're very familiar with that right now. Um, droplets of water in the air, right, that are breathed out by people, carry virus particles with them. Interesting fact, when the air is dry, like in the winter time, 
those droplets are much smaller and they remain airborne a lot longer. Think about how heavy humid air is, right? Water droplets and respiratory droplets in humid air fall to the ground much, much faster than water droplets do in dry air. Combine the dry winter air with the fact that cooler air causes cilia to work more slowly. And that is why you have a lot more cases of cold and flu and things like that in the winter. And that's one of the reasons why they're saying that this winter could be very, very dangerous in terms of like coronavirus and stuff um, that are transmitted on airborne droplets. Because there's going to be a lot more of those droplets around in the air for longer. So the potential for exposure is much greater. Back to common cold though. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with common colds. We've all had them, right? During the first three days is when you're the most contagious, the first three days of your sickness. But you are potentially contagious from the time you get exposed to the after you feel better. Virus that is in mucus on surfaces can be um, viable or potential to link transmit for several hours at least on surfaces. So another good reason to wash your hands. In the lower respiratory system, besides pneumonia, you have whooping cough pertussis. Bordetella pertussis is the bacteria that causes that. Right? It's an obligate aerobic gram-negative cocobacillus. It has a capsule on the more virulent strains because that makes it harder to be recognized by the immune system, right? Um, Bornatella pertussis attaches to the ciliated cells in the trachea, which decreases ciliary action and then destroys the cells, causes toxins, and can cause systemic disease. So it can be really bad. Bacterial pneumonia. Um, kind of like meningitis, bacterial pneumonia, there are lots of different causative agents. And it's named for the site in the respiratory system that is affected. Streptococcus pneumonia is the most common. It's called pneumococcal pneumonia. There's 90 different types of streptococcus pneumonia um, that can cause disease. Pneumococci invade the bloodstream or can invade the bloodstream, um, the pleural cavity, and the meninges. So it can really get everywhere in the body and be very, very bad. Um, some bacterial pneumonia is caused by mycoplasma. Uh, mycoplasma won't really show up on lab tests because it's a very, very tiny, very unusual bacteria. So it's often confused with viral pneumonia. Um, it's a lot common in younger adults and children and it's um, known as walking pneumonia. Other things, Legionnaire's disease, this is actually really interesting, comes from Legionella pneumonia. Pneumophilia causes high fever, cough, um, the general symptoms of pneumonia, but it actually comes from contaminated water. And sometimes we'll see outbreaks um, associated with certain buildings um, because it can be in the water lines of hospitals in biofilms, and we know the biofilms are hard to get rid of. Right, viral pneumonia um, usually is a complication of other viral illnesses. RSV, respiratory succinctal virus, is a respiratory disease um, that's very severe in infants, but almost all children get RSV by the time they're two. For children that are older than very young infants, when they get RSV, it just presents like a cold. But when the infant is very small, um, it can require hospitalization and can be deadly. Influenza itself, we haven't talked a lot about influenza, right? We all deal with influenza um, and flu every year, whether it's um, getting sick or getting a flu shot or giving a flu shot or just talking about it, right? Everyone's familiar with the flu. Chills, fever, headache, muscle aches, cold-like symptoms um, appear as the fever subsides. Interestingly, 30,000 to 50,000 Americans die annually during a non-epidemic year from the flu. The flu virus is really interesting. It has eight different pieces of RNA in its genome um, of differing lengths. On the surface of the influenza virion, there are two different 
types of spikes, HA spikes and NA spikes. That's where the H number, N number comes from for influenzas. The HA spikes are important in recognition of host cells and attachment to them. And the NA spikes actually help the virus exit the host cell after replication. So super interesting there. All right, digestive system. Most diseases in the digestive system come from consuming contaminated stuff, the fecal oral route, right? That's either consuming food or somehow getting a pathogen on your hands and putting it in your mouth. Or dirty water, right? Dirty water is huge. Um, so much so that the fecal oral transmission cycle can be disrupted by good water sanitation. All right, gut function and bacteria. We know what our gut does, right? Uh, the digestive system itself breaks down food into small molecules that are then taken up by cells. In the small intestine, that's where a lot of absorption happens um, into the blood and the lymph. In the large intestine, water, vitamins, and nutrients are absorbed from food. About 25 tons of food passes through the digestive system in an average human lifespan, fun fact. Um, the GI system also has really important parts of your immune system. And it has lots of normal microbiota, right? We know that. Um, most of the microbiota is in the large intestine, but not all of it. Here's another interesting fun fact. One milliliter of saliva can have millions of bacteria in it. Uh, in one gram of feces, there's about 100 billion bacteria for comparison, um, but we know that anyway. And some of that is our normal microbiota that's being shed, right? The stomach itself has a very low bacterial population because of its low pH in the stomach acid. The immune system in the GI tract is really interesting. Um, it's constantly sampling the environment in the gut lumen. Um, looking for pathogens, right? You have lots of um, lots of immune cells that connect with the antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells um, and specialized antigen presenting cells in the gut itself. All right, so we'll start with the mouth and work our way down the digestive system. Um, Tooth decay, dental caries, gingivitis, periodontitis, acute necrotizing, uncreative gingivitis. That might be ultra, um, ulcerative gingivitis. Um, all of those are caused usually by bacteria. Streptococcus mutagens, other gram positive coci, um, essentially the, the ones that are towards the surface of the gums metabolize carbs and can tolerate high levels of acidity in the food that we eat and drink every day. Gingivitis gets down into the gums a little bit and includes bacteria like Streptococcus, Actinomyces bacteria, and anaerobic gram-negatives. Periodontitis uh, is when infection starts to get into the bone and tissue that support the teeth. There um, is one common species of bacteria, the or Phyromonas bacteria, but it can be other species as well. Okay. Then when pathogens get past the mouth and the saliva, um, usually past the stomach acid into the intestines, uh, we can get a lot of different infections as well. Infection usually happens in the gut when the pathogen starts multiplying. Uh, oftentimes it will penetrate into the mucosa and then grow or it can pass through the mucosa to other um, systemic organs. There's usually a delay in symptoms while the pathogen enters tissue and multiplies. Then there's a fever and then there's all of the, the wonderful um, symptoms that go with a GI disease. Interestingly, diarrhea is a major factor in infant mortality in developing countries. 
All right, here's a few of the different kinds of GI diseases that we can encounter. Uh, food poisoning caused by Staphylococcus bacteria, like Staph aureus. It releases uh, toxins into food after it's grown in the food. It can be transmitted by dirty hands to food that was otherwise uninfected because remember, Staph aureus lives in our skin and in our nose. Um, good news is it's prevented by refrigeration. Um, bacteria, um, dysentery or shigellosis um, caused by shigella bacteria, very common in the U.S. The shiga toxin is very, causes very severe disease. It's made by enteragic um, E. coli. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli, sorry. Um, there's other species of Yersinia other than Yersinia pestis that can cause gastroenteritis, gastroenteritis like Yersinia uh, intercom colictica and Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. Um, they can also cause, be problematic in um, transfused blood as well. And there are some species of Clostridium that can cause gastroenteritis. It's one of actually the more common forms of food poisoning in the United States. The endospores survive cooking because those endospores are just so stubborn in Clostridium. Um, and if food is not refrigerated after it's cooked, those endospores will germinate. Salmonella. We talked about salmonella a little bit already. There are lots of different types of salmonella, pretty much all pathogenic. Um, the good news is, is that they're, they're destroyed by normal cooking, right? But they can give you some pretty nasty food poisoning. Um, in salmonella type, you can cause typhoid fever. Cholera. Um, a huge problem, especially in developing countries, um, caused by Vibrio cholera. Remember, Vibrio-shaped bacteria are curved rods. Cholera produces cholera toxin, which um, can cause a lot of inflammation, massive fluid and electrolyte loss, um, and diarrhea causing shock, collapse, and often death. Campylobacter infections, like camp uh, Campylobacter dejuni, those are really, really common sources of food poisoning in the U.S. Almost all retail chicken is contaminated with Campylobacter, um, which can be eliminated by cooking, so that's good. Um, some Campylobacter infections are linked to Guillain-Barre syndrome, interestingly enough, which is a really complex um, disease that we don't completely understand, um, but involves the nervous system. Then we have E. coli, right? Um, we know that E. coli is part of our, certain strains of E. coli are part of our microbiota and are good, but certain strains are pathogenic, and some of those pathogenic strains can secrete some pretty bad toxins. Enteropathogenic E. coli is a major cause of di diarrhea in developing countries and can be fatal in young people. Enteroinvasive E. coli produces Shigella toxin, like I just mentioned, uh, which can cause dysentery. Enteroaggregative E. coli um, can grow in this really interesting stacked brick configuration, which I don't have a picture of, but I wish I did. Um, and it produces toxins that are harmful. And then we have enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which produces a shiga like toxin. Um, there is a very notorious strain of E. coli called O157H7 that causes, that is enterohemorrhagic. Um, cattle are the main reservoir can also contaminate leafy vegetables, so big factor in food poisoning. Helicobacter pylori. H. pylori is really, really interesting. Um, it is a spiral-shaped microaerophile, lives uh, or in, in, infects in the stomach, um, even though the pH of the stomach acid is so low. 30 to 50% of the population is infected with H. pylori. It can cause stomach, or stomach ulcers, um, about 15% of people infected develop stomach ulcers. It can also cause gastric cancer in about 3% of people infected with H. pylori. So the bacteria itself secretes urease, which causes um, a higher pH immediately around the outsides of the cells, which helps buffer it from the stomach acid, which is why they can survive in the stomach. Um, <clears throat> Where infection happens, the stomach mucus can be disrupted, which causes inflammation of the stomach lining and that causes ulcers. 
All right, viral GI pathogens, mumps, respiratory transmission, but it targets the salivary glands, so it's in the GI category a little bit as well. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, D, and E. Um, a is a, an RNA virus. It's non-enveloped. It multiplies in the intestines and then travels to the liver, kidneys, or spleen. Hepatitis B is a double-stranded DNA virus transmitted by blood transfusions um, and in bodily fluid, uh, fever, nausea, abdominal pain, jaundice, dark urine, liver damage may be recoverable if acute. Oh, so there's always that. Um, but chronic infection results in cirrhosis. Hepatitis C is a single-stranded RNA enveloped virus, causes a very big immune response that gradually destroys the liver. Um, hep D and Hep E, you just about never hear about them. They do exist. They're very dangerous. And then you can also get rotavirus infections or calcivirus infections like norovirus um, that can cause GI diseases as well. Some fungi can cause GI disease. Mycotoxins are produced by fungi that um, grow on food. So if you see mold growing on your food, don't eat it because there might be mycotoxins present that will make you sick. Ergot and aflatoxin are in contaminated rye and other cereal grains, which can cause gangrene and hallucinations. Ergot toxin, remember, is the natural source for LSD. I think I mentioned that a couple lectures ago. There's lots of protozoan gut diseases transmitted in contaminated water. Um, giardia, giardiasis um, can cause prolonged diarrhea, takes up residence in the gut. Proptospermium uh, can cause cholera-like diarrhea. Cyclospora can cause bad diarrhea. Amoebic dysentery caused by an amoeba, and amoeba histolytica um, can cause really severe dysentery and perforation of the intestinal wall. Um, and we can classify helmets as GI pathogens because they essentially hook onto the inside of your gut and they eat food as it comes through. All right, we're almost at the end. Microbial diseases in, of the urinary and reproductive systems. So the urinary system um, is full of mucous membranes, right? They're moist, it supports bacterial growth. There are limited normal microbiota in the urinary system. It's usually pretty sterile. Um, in the vagina itself, there's a lot of lactobacillus bacteria, uh, which is increased by estrogen. Uh, but there's also streptococcus, um, anaerobic bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and candida albicans, right? And any of those can um, be pathogenic. There's a lot of opportunistic infections that happen um, in the urinary system and cause UTIs. Usually that's bacterial. Uh, it can start out as inflammation of the urethra. There's a lot of healthcare associated infections of the urinary system, usually by catheters, mostly E. coli, but also Pseudomonas species, right? If bladder infections are untreated, the infection can travel up to the kidneys. Um, here's another interesting urinary disease. Leptospirosis is a disease in animals that can be passed to humans <clears throat> um, by drinking or swimming in water contaminated with animal urine or tissue. It's endemic in tropical areas, including Hawaii. Reproductive diseases, um, if you're in healthcare and even in high school, people spend a lot of time studying STDs, so we're not gonna talk a lot about them. Um, just some causative agents here, gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia is caused by chlamydia trichomitis, uh, can also cause pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, PAD itself is an extensive bacterial infection of the pelvic organs, can cause infertility and chronic pain. Syphilis is caused by Trypanella pallidum, which is a spiral-shaped bacteria. It can produce a very intense inflammatory response, which causes tissue destruction and can, can be systemic. Uh, and then vaginitis, which can be caused by candida albicans, right, or can be caused by a protist uh, called Trichomonas vaginalis. Viral reproductive diseases, we've got herpes, HSV2, 
um, HSV2 can cross the placental barrier. Genital warts caused by papillomaviruses. Um, two types of papillomavirus um, serotypes 16 and 18 are very heavily implicated in cervical cancer. Um, and then we have AIDS and HIV, which are considered viral reproductive diseases. Okay, so in summary, we talked about diseases of the skin and the eyes, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, and the lymph, respiratory system, the digestive system, and the urinary and reproductive system. And this brings us to the end. Um, this is the last content chapter of this course. So hopefully it brings together everything you've learned and turns it into um, information that's relevant for life and um, your careers as far as you go um, with medicine or whatnot. So thank you very much.